Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's great to see all of you today. Uh, happy Tuesday, October the 8th. Uh, I'm just going to start screen share here. We'll get into it. Uh, as Sebastian said, good afternoon. My name is Melody McMillan. Uh, I use she, her pronouns and proudly serve as the senior executive director for the nationally recognized Seattle Promise program. Uh, just share a little bit about me. Uh, I have more than 15 years of experience working in higher education, 10 of those in higher education administration, uh, specifically in college admissions, registration, new student orientation, academic advising, financial aid, student database systems, uh, and project management. My uh, other full-time job is West Seattle mom. I'm the proud parent of two almost perfect kiddos, uh, Lucas and Madeline. And uh, as uh, stated earlier, I currently oversee the Seattle Promise Program, which is a program funded by the City of Seattle's uh, Families, Education, Preschool, and Promise Levy. The Seattle Promise Program provides Seattle Public School graduates up to two years of free college tuition and then other promise perks that we'll talk about in a moment here uh, at any of the Seattle colleges. Uh, we have more than 40 full-time employees, some of who you see on the screen here, who their sole jobs are to support high school students with making the transition from high school to college as successfully and smoothly as possible. So I have some experience in successfully supporting uh, in Seattle, thousands of students and their families to access and achieve their college going goals. So uh, Jessica and Sebastian, thank you so much for inviting me to be here today. I'm, I'm really genuinely excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is helping teens and their families prepare for college. Uh, so today I am going to share about three main things. Uh, one is preparing for change together. This is a major life change that is happening when we think about that transition from, um, you know, really like being a minor to uh, going to college and, and you know, this like hard launch into adulthood almost. Uh, two is um, thinking about how to process and work through some of the like college going paperwork in advance. Uh, and then three is around managing expectations with that college going uh, process. If you are here today, I imagine it's because there is a kiddo or young adult in your life who you care about very much and who may be nearing an age where post-secondary options and plans are feeling increasingly relevant uh, in the day-to-day -day conversation. So Today, I am planning to really focus on some of the things that can have a big impact on a smooth versus maybe bumpier college planning and transition experience for you and your young adult. Um, please know that many of the things that I'm gonna share today, these can start at as young an age as, as makes sense for you and your family. Um, and at the same time, you're not necessarily like behind if you are just starting some of this in the 12th grade year. Um, when I when we think about supporting young adults, teenagers <laughs> with transitioning to college, we're really talking about layers of difficult stuff. Um, you know, 17, 18 year olds, they are managing multiple life changes, many of which may feel crushingly intense all simultaneously. Uh, I imagine that many of you who are here today may remember feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders when you were 18. Uh, you know, for many of our students, they are trying to earn strong grades. They are taking their SATs and ACTs. Maybe they're completing their AP or IB exams. Um, they're deciding what to do about homecoming and how to work through prom <laughs> uh, logistics. They're navigating complex and amorphous social situations uh, in their personal lives. They're trying to decide on a major in college. They're trying to identify possible career paths for themselves while also researching colleges and universities. Uh, maybe they're balancing a job and other family responsibilities. They're trying to figure out how much exactly is college going to cost, um, whether or not they can figure out how to afford to go. Uh, they're ordering a cap and gown and they're looking at yearbook stuff. They're also balancing, you know, final year, final senior year activities, athletics, theater, band, academic clubs, all the things. Uh, there's this growing list of deadlines, right? That and requirements that our students are managing and they have not ever had to manage any of those things um, maybe this intensely before. So it's a lot 
for real, like just want to validate. Um, it's a lot of pressure that is, you know, bearing down on our 17, 18 year old teenagers and you as the caring adult in their life. So no wonder they are stressed. Um, and so for me, here's the thing is that there are parts of high school that are, are, this is real. They're going to be hard. Um, and there are parts of the high school experience and even the like transition to college experience where, um, they're unpredictable. They're out, some things are going to be out of our control. Uh, that being said, as it relates to post-secondary planning, uh, there are many things, maybe more than what people realize, that are very predictable. We can plan for them in advance. We can limit, um, you know, unexpected surprises for everyone involved. And I think that that is one of the best ways that we can support young adults with this. Um, who are in high school and thinking about their post-secondary options is to support them with learning how a little pre-planning -pre and, you know, like pre-research can go a long way in terms of overall stress reduction when we think about all the many, many things that um, our students are kind of carrying in their final years of high school. When we think about the things that cause stress just broadly, we can often group stressors into four broad categories. Uh, uh, the things I'm gonna talk about today fall into one or more of these categories. Uh, and again, thankfully, for the most part, when it comes to planning for and going to college, there are some tried and true strategies where we can minimize the impact of some of these stressors. Um, you know, things like having new experiences, new pressures in life, uh, we can play a role to normalize that, yeah, new is hard, um, and that may feel uneasy. Uh, when we think about unexpected situations, uh, there is actually like quite a lot that we can do as the caring grown-up <laughs> uh, supporting a teenager to limit the num overall number of surprises uh, that may, you know, creep up on us. Um, you know, this idea of, of threats to sense of self, there is, there's a lot of um, development that is happening with young adults, especially in those final years of high school and those early years of college. So um, normalizing that going to college and uh, is is like it includes learning new things about yourself and your interests and your motivations. And that may change your sense of self in some ways. Uh, and so normalizing like that's normal and a part of like growing up and um, you know, kind of coming into yourself. Uh, and then the last thing is, um, you know, we have an opportunity to really focus on the areas where we do have control because there are going to be a bunch of things that, um, you know, we maybe have less control over. Uh, one of the areas that um, is <laughs> both uh, that one of the areas that can be really, you know, tricky and hard for um, our teenagers when they're thinking about college and or at, like actively making that transition from high school to college um, is the idea of choosing a major, like settling on a major and or a career pathway. Um, you know, most people are going to college because in theory, it's supposed to provide a more direct path to higher wage jobs over time. This means that there's a lot of pressure on our college going students to choose a major that is going to lead to both a fulfilling and a livable wage job or career at the end. Um, and I would say, you know, in fact, really from day one, uh, when your student is filling out that admissions application uh, to college or universities uh, that they're considering, they're going to be asked, what program <laughs> do you want to study? Uh, and so from my perspective, I think that there are four things that you can do as the uh, caring grown-up in this dynamic to support your teen with working through um, this decision that feels really, really impactful and heavy. One is um, you can play a role to lower the stakes of this decision. Uh, just some some national data is nationally traditional aged college freshmen. They are changing their majors an average of three or more times once they start college. So uh, this is not incredibly surprising that 
most people don't know what they want to study or they don't have a clear career path in mind by the time that they're 18 or 19. Uh, the data actually point in the entirely opposite direction. Not only do they not know, uh, but also they need time and exposure to narrow down what they don't want to do. And in some cases, your child might be experiencing that at some point they did want to do something. Now that they know more, they've learned more, they've had some exposure, uh, now they no longer want to go in that direction. <clears throat> and so, you know, lowering the stakes, normalizing that like many students don't know when they're 19 <laughs> what they want to what they what they want to do with their, you know, career or even their first career, not even their whole lives. Uh, and and that's okay. <clears throat> that being said, uh, this leads me to maybe point number two is um, one of the things that you can do to help with this is to encourage active exploration of possible paths. It It's okay to be undecided uh, as long as they are actively looking at different options and, and different pathways. Um, in high school, you know, actively exploring options might include talking to teachers or other caring adults in their life, maybe taking an internship or thinking about um, job shadows with uh, you know, people who are maybe in your network as a parent. Uh, Want to insert a, a plug here for the City of Seattle's uh, Seattle Youth Employment Program that is run out of the City of Seattle's Human Services Department. Uh, they have done a really incredible job to revamp and enhance the um, student internship and like career learning opportunities for young adults in Seattle, starting as as young as age 16. So students can apply. Um, to, you know, work with the human services department for paid summer or year long uh, opportunities to be, you know, exploring what are some career paths that may be of interest. Uh, and then, you know, once your student is in college, if they're still undecided, which again, normal, uh, and or maybe they're realizing that the program that they thought they wanted to do is not working. So again, like questioning that sense of self. Um, there are resources on campuses to help your student navigate the exploration process. So just encourage you to, you know, at home and, and when you're connecting with your student, you keep an environment um, that allows them to have these open, honest conversations with you about how they're thinking about things, how they're navigating this type of a hard issue, just broadly, like how they're doing. Uh, and then encourage them to use the resources at their college where staff are trained to be and can be a little bit more prescriptive uh, with how to navigate exploring, you know, a new major or career path or related. Um, you know, this idea of like, you, you have the privilege and the opportunity to be a safe space for your student or your child. Um, and then have them use the resources at the college or university or in their high school um, where maybe that person can be a little, you know, like a little more direct, a little more prescriptive. Uh, other, other ways to actively explore possible paths um, is maybe you are sharing your own personal journey. Like, how did you choose a major? Uh, and how did you choose a job? I think, you know, focusing on sharing the things in your life that led to how you made an informed decision about what you studied and then ultimately what jobs you ended up taking, uh, that can be really helpful. Uh, you know, related here, we know that many teens are by nature very social. Um, and so this is a perfect opportunity to also like summon your village. Uh, so, you know, the people who care about you and your student, they may be able to create spaces where your teen can process their thoughts about majors or careers without a parent present. Um, that sometimes is a complicated dynamic, right? Uh, inviting other grownups in your teen's life to share about what was their academic or career journey. How did they make informed decisions about, you know, like how to work through all of these many, many choices related to majors or programs or jobs? Uh, when your teen is with their friends, ask their friends, what are they considering? What have you considered? Uh, and just want to elevate here that the goal in those spaces is not necessarily to like find an answer or to have your student like have this eureka aha moment. Um, that may happen, but really it's more about normalizing 
using your network and people who you trust to make big decisions and to like inform how you, you know, are moving forward with, with making these choices. Um, choosing a major in a career path can feel challenging and stressful for many young adults. It's stressful for me. Uh, <laughs> Starting in high school and, you know, that often extends into the first couple of years of college. This is normal stress to have. Um, it's a, you know, normal part of coming of age or like young adult development. It is hard. Um, I do think that, you know, number four here is you can help make some aspects of that a little less intense by fostering this like door is always open environment, uh, you know, again, where your student knows that they can come to you as a thought partner or even like a really great listener when they are wrestling with this dynamic and like ever changing list of um, opportunities and options when it comes to, you know, what feels like a really big decision to make. Um, I, you, there are some parts of the college going experience that don't have to be quite as emotionally taxing on you or your child, your young adult. Um, college paperwork, including like applying for college and applying for financial aid. Those are two things that you can have a little bit more control over um, and they don't have to take you or your student by surprise. So, you know, when we think about things that cause stress, um, unexpected situations, uh, you know, things taking you by surprise, but then they require like some level of action or you know, investigation on your part, that can be really stressful. So, uh, you know, we can support our teens to prepare in advance for some of these things that we know are highly predictable. Um, I yeah, would say, in broadly speaking, colleges and universities are, uh, broadly speaking, again, oftentimes painfully slow to change. Uh, and in some spaces, that can be really difficult and frustrating. Uh, what I would say as it relates to application deadlines, you know, some of this paperwork stuff, um, maybe this is an advantage because it means that application deadlines and when things are due and when they're going to open is like actually high, very highly predictable. Um, those are slow and very unlikely to change year after year. Um, in fact, you can usually know admissions application deadlines years in advance, even if they're not like publicly officially posted yet. Uh, because if we love anything in higher ed, it is a system and structure that doesn't really uh, change uh, that fluidly. I'll pick on, pick on UW as an example. Um, I don't even work at University of Washington, and I can almost guarantee you that if you have a student who is graduating in class of 2027, 2028, maybe beyond, most likely their application deadline as a freshman uh, will probably be in November of their senior year. And how do I know that? Because that's how it has been for many, many years. Um, and I think you will find that many, most colleges and universities nationwide are the same. These application deadlines, they rarely change year to year. Um, this is great news for you and your student because it means that you can plan for this in advance. Uh, the application and like those timelines, they don't have to sneak up on you. You can know with a high degree of predictability um, you know, when these things are going to become available and when they're going to be due. The same goes for the FAFSA or the WASFA. That's the paperwork that you need to complete uh, to apply for federal and state and then of, often institutional financial aid. Um, you probably know this already. 2024 is the first time uh, in decades, decades, <laughs> that the FAFSA was updated. Um, this is, you know, I think in terms of like, having some predictability, this is great news because it means that it will probably be a really long time before another major update is made. Uh, and so that means like you can assemble the list of documents or information that you're going to need to complete the FAFSA right now. Um, this is not a secret list of, you know, what you need to have in order or your student in order to complete the FAFSA. No one has to be scrambling for tax information or, uh, you know, numbers of things. Uh, you know, mid FAFSA application, because we already know in advance with a high degree of predictability, what is going to be required. Um, your student can probably, in most cases, complete their college admissions application on their own. Uh, want to yeah. just be like really, want to be really clear and, and elevate that uh, they cannot complete the FAFSA or WASFA without parent or guardian support. They need you to be involved in a part of this. 
Uh, so if you are the parent or guardian in the relationship, take some time to look up what are the things that you're going to need to compile before you sit with your student to complete these forms online. Um, one example is with the new FAFSA, you and your student will need to create as an example, again, an FSA ID before you can complete and submit the FAFSA form. Uh, the FSA ID takes three to five business days to be verified and approved. So now we know in advance, this is gonna be a multi-step and multi-day process uh, for both you and your student. And I know, you know, things like this seem really small, but um, not having the surprise of, we had planned to do our FAFSA together tonight, but actually we, are not gonna get it done tonight because we're waiting on our FSA ID, not having that type of a surprise um, can really alleviate stress for, for both you and your students. So, you know, going into this knowing, like you have to do step one before you can do step two, there's a gap of time <laughs> that is gonna pass. Kind of similar for the WASFA, um, you have to set up an account with the WASFA before you can fill out that paperwork if you're doing the WASFA instead of the FAFSA. So the good news about this is like, there is paperwork that is required as a part of the college going um, process, but a lot of the paperwork parts of things are, are really predictable and we can have a good sense of when they're gonna be open and available and then also do, um, you know, far in advance. So, uh, you know, recommendation that we often make to Seattle Public Schools families uh, is sometime in junior year, start a shared note, you know, on your phone, start a shared note or a shared calendar with your students so that the two of you can be adding application deadlines and reminders. I'll keep a list of what are the documents that you're going to need for either, you know, admissions or financial aid applications. Um, and then schedule times to sit with your student and just like work through the paperwork part of this. Uh, some tips on the paperwork part before I move on here. Uh, and these are good tips. So, so write these down. <laughs> Number one, uh, make sure that your student is using the same email address for all of their college going paperwork. Uh, so this should be an email that they are going to retain after high school graduation. Um, so like don't use the email that they get issued by their school district. Uh, this will help colleges and universities to make quicker matches between other pieces of paperwork. So as an example, making a quicker match between your college or university application, your FAFSA and your IB exam results. Um, another tip is have your student double and maybe even triple check that their social security number or their I-10 information is accurate before they submit any paperwork. Um, this is this specifically is a space where um, it is time well invested to make sure that those that those numbers are put in accurately. Um, one accidental transposed number here can be the difference between you and your student enjoying Seafair weekend um, or bumper shoot or standing in line at the residency office to verify your identity in person. Uh, so this is an area, uh, it makes sense to double, triple check that all the numbers are accurate. Uh, there's some other paperwork related things that you can prepare for in advance. One is to plan to have your AP or IB exam scores submitted to the college or university where you plan to enroll. Uh, likewise, if your student did running start or has college in the high school credit and ask your student about this, um, it is every year shocking to me the number of students who have college in the high school credit and their parents had no idea that they earned college level credit and have now a transcript. Um, you know, before graduating from high school. So make sure that you ask about that. Uh, but all of these things, you are probably going to need to have those official college transcripts and official scores sent to the school where your student's going to be enrolling. Um, don't have the, you can have a copy sent to you if, if you are interested. Um, you want to have transcripts go straight to the college or university though, unless they give you very specific guidance otherwise. Um, in that shared note that you have started now or calendar with your student, uh, you know, choose a day when you're going to sit down and request, you know, just line by line, like that all these transcripts, all this paperwork is being sent so that you can just be done with it. Um, nobody wants to be in a situation where you're getting you and or your student are getting emails about, hey, we need this transcript. We can't process your admissions until you do this. Um, you know, 
make a checklist in advance for where do we need to have, where do we have transcripts and where do we need to have them sent uh, so that you can just get it done and, and not have to worry about it. The last thing on paperwork, I uh, want to spend a little bit of time talking about working with disability services or access services. Uh, if your student has or had an IEP or a 504 plan in high school, uh, you're going to want to talk to them about connecting with disability or access services at their college as early as that office allows. Uh, so as soon as your student, as your child has decided I'm for sure going to, let's pick Seattle Central College, um, but it doesn't matter where, right? Uh, as soon as they have chosen, do some digging to see how soon are, can your, can your student be working with the Office of Disability or Access Services? Um, some things that I want you to know in advance, again, in the spirit of like limiting unexpected and kind of unwelcome surprises in this process uh, is colleges and universities in America, we are fundamentally funded differently than K the K-12 public systems when it comes to supporting students with disabilities. And because of that, uh, it's closely related, the accommodation laws are not the same that they are in the K-12 system. Also like the types of accommodations that students may be able to receive may look or feel different um, in college compared to maybe what your student was used to, uh, how they were used to being supported in you know, high school or in the K-12 system. In most cases, uh, your, your child will need to schedule an appointment with the Disability or Access Services Office, um, and they may need to provide documentation from a medical provider that indicates the severity or the impact of the disability related specifically to completing coursework in and out of the classroom. So, you know, physically in the classroom, but then also if there's a virtual or hybrid component to that college coursework. Um, oftentimes the office will need the medical provider to clarify the type, the specific type of accommodation that is needed or requested to have a more accessible college experience. We often recommend that, um, you know, students do a little bit of research around what type of accommodations, um, you know, are often provided in the college or university setting so that they can think about what may work well for them and then let their medical provider, you know, be a little prescriptive with your medical provider around these are the types of accommodations that would be helpful for me. Um, the other thing here is many offices uh, in the college and university setting uh, many disability or access services offices will require that your child is using their specific form. So reduce some frustration just right from the get-go by checking to see, is that the case before anyone asks a medical provider to provide a note? Um, there are a few things more frustrating than, uh, you know, taking the time and making the effort to go get a note, another note from your medical provider bringing it to the office and then the office being like, well, that's a great note, but we actually need it on this specific form instead. Um, so, you know, doing a little bit of, of digging there can, can be really impactful and helpful. Um, related to, you know, encouraging your student or maybe the two of you do this together, uh, you know, researching what are some of the maybe more frequently provided accommodations in the college or university setting. I do think that that's helpful. Um, Want to elevate that the goal with that activity is not to necessarily like choose an accommodation, although maybe that happens, um, so much as it is to help your student acclimate to how things may function and, and again, like feel different um, in that post-secondary setting. Uh, you know, like going back to we're controlling what we can control, we're providing a safe space at home to process through these like big life changes and like changes in how they are going to be experiencing life. Um, and then, you know, supporting your, your young adult to use these resources that are available to them to limit the number of unexpected surprises in this process. Um, last thing on disability services is, you know, I do think that starting a conversation when it's possible, starting a conversation before college begins um, can help manage expectations and reduce surprises that contribute to overall stress. Um, another area where we can support teens with managing expectations and reducing surprises is related to 
course placement, registration, and new student orientation. So I'm gonna jump to those topics next. So once you've been accepted, <laughs> Uh, your child has been accepted to college or university, they've chosen where they're planning to enroll for college, um, you're going to want to encourage them to research if that college or university requires any type of course or discipline specific placement exams. Uh, so as an example, uh, if they are going to, if they're planning to take a chemistry class, um, you know, or be in like a STEM major, uh, is there any type of chemistry placement exam that the chemistry department might require uh, in advance? Same thing goes for, I think, you know, more maybe common or widespread is math or English placement testing. Uh, but we are seeing, you know, an increase in the number of discipline specific spaces where students may need to take um, a placement exam. What I just would elevate here is our seniors, have they have enough surprises that come at them all throughout 12th grade. Uh, placement exams where we can help avoid it should not be on that surprise list. Uh, usually, often, usually a quick Google can clarify if placement exams would be needed. Um, and if you're not or your student isn't finding, you know, something easy to access and like understand on the web, um, this is entirely appropriate to ask an admissions or academic advisor about uh, related to placement exams. You know, just a broad like, hey, is this required at this university? And is there anything that, you know, we can do to um, get more information and like, what's the timeline and how does this work? Uh, your, your student will also wanna understand when they can register or when they will be registered uh, for their first quarter or semester of classes. Um, for most colleges and universities, this will be listed somewhere on the academic calendar and a quick you know, Google search can probably clarify the answer of like, when can they register for classes? Um, this is also really appropriate to ask an admissions or academic advisor if you aren't finding the answer very clearly. Um, where sometimes things get a little bit gray is if your child is bringing in any level of college credit. So whether that is from running start or college in the high school or AP or IB, sometimes those credits will change their initial registration window. Uh, and that's something that, you know, to the extent possible, it's, it's like helpful to know that in advance um, so that this is not, it's not sneaking up on them as like, oh my gosh, today I need to register for college classes, uh, you know, that you can be preparing in advance, um, for what that may look like. New student orientation is another area where, um, you know, we can help <laughs> yeah, prepare our students, like man some level, like manage expectations here. Uh, new student orientation is often required for most freshmen at most colleges and universities, um, by the time new student orientation is happening, probably you and your student may have a long list of questions about a variety of things um, in the spirit of managing expectations. And also, you know, again, like limiting those unwelcome surprises. Uh, just want to like say that I think new student orientation is a space where we can help our, our young adults, maybe lower in some cases their expectations of like just what to expect um, at these events. Every new student orientation is gonna be a little bit different depending on where you're going and, and what program you're in. Um, many are built in a way that don't always create space for individual questions to be like fully and wholly answered. So instead of um, your student going to new, you know, new student orientation expecting like, I'm gonna bring my list of questions and I'm gonna get them answered. I think that uh, you know a better direction here is encourage your student to um, use new student orientation as an opportunity to clarify who the right person is <laughs> to sit with them later and help answer their questions and how to contact them. Like, how do we get on their calendar so that we can go through this list of questions? Um, it's really, you know, very, very difficult and like psychologically hard to go to this, these big events thinking you're going to leave with a lot more clarity. And maybe sometimes you're actually leaving with um, more questions. So, you know, using this as an opportunity to like figure out who is the person who can sit with you, um, you know, can maybe help direct some of that energy and in, in what ultimately will be a more pro productive direction. Last note I have on managing expectations and, uh, you know, limiting those difficult surprises uh, is about finances and, and just talking about, you know, paying for college. Um, 
you all probably have seen that student loan debt has been a national hot topic. That is for a reason. It is expensive to go to college. Um, and even if your student is receiving federal or state aid, it's still pretty expensive to go to college. College costs more than tuition. Um, and you you know your child. So I, you know, I would recommend as soon as they are mature enough to have a conversation with you about paying for college and like, what is your family's plan for this? And like, what are your expectations of, um, you know, your child when, when it comes to figuring out how to pay for college? I just encourage you to initiate that conversation as soon as, um, you know, you are assessing that they're mature enough and like ready for that conversation. I think that the earlier that, you know, as parents that we, or guardians or just like caring adults, uh, in a teen's life, the earlier that we can start those conversations and just normalize, like talking about this part might be challenging and difficult, but also like we're going to be thought partners in this together uh, is is really helpful rather than, you know, you um, or your child having an experience of like, all right, we're headed as an example to new student orientation. And then it's all like, you know, coming of, you know, the left hand wasn't talking to the right hand in terms of like who's paying for what or how is this working or what were the expectations? Um, the, some, you know, there's lots of options to fund college. Uh, uh, what things I wanna elevate here are applying for the FAFSA or WASFA, for sure do this. Um, because of the role that I'm in with the Seattle Promise program right now, it is um, really surprising to me every year uh, the number of families who are, they will be like, well, we're not doing the FAFSA because we make too much money, or we already know that we won't qualify for, you know, Pell Grant or state aid or whatever it may be. Um, what I want to elevate for you is um, many schools are moving in a direction, if they're not already there, where we are using the data from the FAFSA or WASFA to additionally inform institutional scholarship awards. So, you know, we're able to look at that data and see, you know, are you in a space where um, you're maybe not, your family isn't eligible for Pell scholarship, you know, Pell grant as an example, um, but also it would probably be a hardship for you to just like pay out of pocket. Uh, and that data can be really helpful for, um, you know, getting students access to those institutional um, or like foundation scholarship awards. So even if you are thinking, I'm not going to do this because I'm. We're not going to qualify income-wise. Just strongly encouraging you still plan to do the FAFSA or WASFA with your student because it may open up other doors for aid eligibility. Um, <clears throat> you know, apply for scholarships. Want to give a shout out to the WSOS scholarship. Uh, it's the Washington State Opportunity Scholarship for students who are pursuing STEM um, degrees. So if you have a student who's interested in a STEM field. Um, and I'm elevating them because we have a partnership with them through Seattle Promise, but they are an incredible scholarship program um, where students uh, can get tens of thousands of dollars to apply towards their STEM degree. Uh, and included in that is a mentor for, you know, our STEM intending students. Um, if, you're, if your child is thinking about going to um, a private school, uh, you know, sometimes you are able to negotiate a financial aid package that's probably less likely to be effective at a public or like state state school. Um, but every now and then we will hear a success story for families who, you know, have been able to effectively work with private um, institutions, you know, talking about and then other things, right, you know, part time employment, student loans. Is there financial assistance from family or not? But, it, you know, I think just elevating that um, having open, transparent um, you know, like low stakes, low emotion conversations around this, uh, you know, frequent and early is is helpful. This is maybe a good segue uh, for me to briefly just talk about the Seattle Promise program. We're on the home stretch here, and then I'm going to uh, pause and, and just see if there are any questions here. Uh, I, again, oversee the Seattle Promise program. What is that? Uh, the Seattle Promise program is a program that provides up to two years or 90 college credits of tuition. Uh, at the Seattle Colleges, so North, Central, or South Seattle College for all Seattle public graduates uh, from all 22 public high schools in our city. So that includes all uh, 18 high schools from the Seattle Public School District, 
Um, and then additionally, the three public charter schools that are in Seattle. Uh, the program is, op again, if, as long as you're graduating from high school, um, regardless of GPA, income, so there's not an income limit, um, citizenship or residency status. If you're graduating from a Seattle public school, you're eligible for the Seattle Promise program. There are some milestones that students need to be meeting in terms of um, you know, submitting an application in their senior year so that we can help them stay on track with that college going, uh, you know, process and, you know, helping them stay on track with their FAFSA or WASFA or orientation or completing financial aid, things like that. Students who are in the Seattle Promise program, you know, obviously get this full tuition uh, support at any of the three Seattle colleges. Um, they also get, we have talked about it in the past as like wraparound supports. It's real, the program really has grown um, quite significantly over the last six years since it started. Uh, in addition to application, so like the paperwork part that we talked about earlier, in addition to help there, um, students also get um, an advisor, retention specialist uh, when they are enrolled at our colleges. Uh, students have access to paid intern, priority paid internships through that Seattle Youth Employment Program. Uh, we also have transfer pathways, want to elevate our path to UW program. Um, student, Seattle Promise students who participate in the path to UW program, uh, they are 20% more likely to be accepted and enroll as transfer students at UW compared to any other transfer applicant at UW Seattle. Uh, we'll pay fees for income eligible students. In some cases, we can pay past due balances. Um, for our men of color, we're, you know, getting them connected with mentors. If some life happens, something happens, and they lose eligibility, we have um, a pathway for students to come back into the program. Uh, also have, um, yeah, that WSOS opportunity. Uh, Seattle Promise students get essentially guaranteed um, scholarship access through WSOS as long as they're meeting the criteria. Students get ORCA cards while they're enrolled with us. We have a you know, growing alumni connection. Um, students who are in this program, they are retained at higher rates compared to non-Seattle Promise students, both at Seattle colleges, but also across um, the entire 34 community colleges in our state. Copy paste what I just said, but apply it towards graduation and completion rates. So we're really, really proud um, of the students who are in this program. Uh, and, you know, proud of the work that we have been able to do um, with this program. This year's class of 24, uh, graduating class of 2024, we had more than 74% of all seniors uh, in our city apply for the Seattle Promise program. Um, we've had a lot of successes. We've been really fortunate to be recognized um, at the national level from NPR and The Guardian. Um, Seattle Times has been really, really good to us as well. Uh, to help elevate, you know, this opportunity for students. Um, students in the Seattle Promise program, they can choose from more than 130 programs uh, that are offered at the Seattle colleges, everything from aviation maintenance technician to political science or computer science, uh, to culinary, apparel design, everything in between, um, lots and lots of options. Uh, what I want to end with today is, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and choices that your teen is going to be weighing and wading through uh, the closer that they get to high school graduation. Some of these things are going to be difficult and unpredictable. The college going part in many instances can be fairly predictable and and like to some extent, if we're planning in advance, like a little bit in our control. Um, you know, with a little bit of pre-planning, this doesn't have to be doesn't have to be significantly contributing to the overall stress that your child is managing as they as they you know launch into adulthood. Um, what I would leave you with is, you know, even when things are hard, senior year is hard on everyone. Um, you've got this. You have made it through hard things already together. You and your child, you can do this. They can do this. Um, you know, in the blink of an eye, you are going to be helping them navigate picking out health insurance options through their new fancy full-time job after college graduation. Um, but, you know, listen, this is real. As someone who just, I just taught a human how to use the potty a couple weekends ago. Um, if the two of you, you and your child, you figured out potty training together, you can figure out this college thing together. Hands down, no problem. Um, Want to thank you for your time today. Thanks for being here. I'm happy to take questions if there are any. I I posted in a Q and A feature. If you want to look, 
yes, I can go ahead and take a take a look at that. And uh, Melody, simply amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to share all that information with us. Um, I think uh, the question was here: uh, What was the best way to check if college credits from running start, et cetera, are acceptable by are accepted by uh, various colleges? Yeah, the um, a few things that you can do. One is you can search for the transfer course equivalency guide for the college where you're planning to enroll at. And oftentimes, like on your own, using that transfer course equivalency guide, you can connect. Like if you took English 101 at Shoreline Community College, um, how will that be applied to your transcript if you enroll at UW Bothell, as an example? Um, if you're not finding that, then some other options are, one, you could just have your tran your transcript from Shoreline, send it over to the credentials office um, where your student's planning to enroll and they're, and they're gonna evaluate it. Um, you'll get an official evaluation back. Um, alternatively, you can also schedule time to either meet with a transfer um, with a transfer admissions specialist or a credentials advisor uh, to just, you know, talk through, like, here's my transcript. What is it looking like? We'll transfer over. Thank, Thank you. you. And just a quick follow-up um, in your experience, like, is it running start in, you know, that's running in Seattle? Is it acceptable by most state schools, private schools? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. And great presentation, by the way. Um, I'm going to go through and kind of read the other questions from chat. So um, my apologies, Melody, if you may have already answered some of these uh, in your presentation. But I think, uh, yes, look, looks like you covered this one already, but I'll just read it anyway here. It's uh, if, if the student has a 504 and have a plan uh, from a neuropsychologist, do we need to meet with, with folks? Um, and I think you did answer yes to that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, you know, the, the best course of action, thinking about the transition from high school to college related to IEP or 504 plans um, is to schedule time to meet with as soon as the department will allow schedule time to meet with the Office of Disability or Access Services. Um, and then, you know, that other, I think, really big component here is check to see, is there a, you know, specific form that they require that um, your neuropsychologist or other, you know, healthcare provider is filling out because sometimes that can be um, challenging to like kind of usher back and forth between your medical provider and, and the college or university. Understood. Uh, and it looks like uh, got a couple questions. I think we may have already covered this one as well, but uh, as far as the uh, Running Start Seattle Promise, they're applicable to all school districts uh, in King County. My internet blipped. I'm so sorry, Sebastian. Can oh, you no say worries. that one more time? Yeah, uh, I think you may have answered this one already, but as far as that running, uh, running start Seattle Promise, those are any student from any school district in King, King County can apply to that. Is that correct? Yeah, so Running Start is um, uh, Washington State versions of dual enrollment. Uh, so if you are not from Washington State, dual enrollment may be more familiar language, uh, but it's the idea that you, while you are in high school, you are taking and earning college level courses and credits um, that simultaneously will uh, also meet high school graduation requirements. So as an example, if you have to have 12th grade English language, um, you could take English 101 at your local community college. That would count towards your high school graduation requirement and would count towards your English 101 requirement uh, for when you go into high school, go from high school to college. Uh, the Seattle Promise Program um, currently is funded by the City of Seattle's Families Education Preschool and Promise levy. Uh, so it is um, currently restricted to students who are graduating from a Seattle public school, whether that is from the Seattle Public School District or one of the three public uh, charter schools that is within Seattle city limits. Um, what I would add is that um, through King County Promise, which is funded through a different funding stream. Um, there are some other promise programs that um, are uh, evolving at some of our sister locations like Highline, 
um, Brenton Tech. I know Shoreline has also been entertaining. You know, what could this look like for, for them as well? Currently for Seattle Promise, though, um, it is limited to students who are graduating from a Seattle public school. Understood. Thank you. Um, and someone asked, uh, if what if parents are divorced? How does the student pick which uh, parents or families income? I'm assuming this is regarding like a FAFSA. Yeah, really good question. Uh, the the best way to research that is to go to financial aid, finaid.gov. Uh, and there is an FAQ that can walk you through like in depth. It's kind of a decision making tree will walk you through in depth. Um, you know, what is like, where does the student primarily reside? What does the custody agreement look like? Um, some other, you know, like individual specific to your situation, um, questions that will help you work through, um, like which parent needs to be the signing parent on the FAFSA. Thank you. And it looks like um, someone asked, uh, what are the dates on the Seattle Promise? I'm assuming like deadlines wise, and uh, will this still be around for my younger kids? Yeah, so if you have a student um, who will be graduating from a Seattle Public High School in, as a part of class of 2025, one, congrats, you've made it. Um, but two is their deadline is February 14th, uh, 2025. Um, and then um, our hope is that this program is going to continue to be funded and, and sustained. Um, currently, it's, it is fully funded through that FEP levy. Um, the FEP levies in the education levies in Seattle are on seven year rotations. So um, it will be on your ballot uh, for the November 4th, 2025 election. So um, we certainly are hoping that funding will continue for, uh, you know, generations to come. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. That one and... Uh, is WSOS only for students attending colleges in Washington? So my understanding is that there are some, um, there may be some situ some situations on a case by case basis where that funding can follow a student um, outside of Washington State, but that is governed by the WSOS um, ad administrators and board. But my understanding is that there can be some flexibility. Uh, and then I'm looking for that uh, link to put in the chat, Lisa. Great. And go ahead, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm also responding as well. <laughs> um, All righty. And uh, Tanya asked, uh, what do you recommend we search to, uh, for, to, or to learn about admission deadlines for UW or just WSU uh, for out years? Yeah, I, in, I, you know, making kind of a generalization here, but um, it is true that higher ed um, is often slow to, slow to change. And as it relates to admission deadlines, that benefits us um, because it means that those deadlines are often like pretty predictable. Um, you know, I, what we do internally here is, um, you know, we'll take a look at what are the current deadlines for, uh, like this year's incoming class of freshmen, um, we will also often, you know, Google like what was last year's deadline. And if they're matching, um, that is a pretty good indicator. Uh, sometimes you can even go two years back. Uh, and if those are matching, then that's a pretty good indicator that um, those dates will likely be consistent for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, SATs are no longer required. Deciding on if we should take the SATs uh, has been a struggle for us. Uh, do you have any recommendations on if this is something we should uh, consider or if this, is, if this is something we should skip instead? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that a good starting point is, you know, to, to work with your teen on um, you know, assembling the list of like, what are the schools that they are planning to apply for? Um, and, you know, start with like the longer version of the list. 
uh, you know, do quick Google searches on, is there, for any of those schools, uh, is there any reason that an SAT would, you know, in some way benefit either for admission purposes or for placement purposes? Um, you know, would that benefit benefit your child? Uh, if you are seeing that the answer kind of seems like no, that there's not really an advantage to um, taking or bringing in SAT scores, um, you know, the other thing that you could do if you're just wanting, you know, like one more layer of assurance before you make the call to like skip it, right, uh, is you could reach out to um, the admission count, the admission staff or admission team at uh, the college or university where you're thinking about um, and just like clarify, you know, hey, we see that it's SAT optional. We're not planning on doing that. Can you help us understand what could be the ripple effects of making that choice? And probably you're going to get, uh, you know, an answer back that's like probably limited <laughs> ripple effects. And then and then you have your answer about, you know, um, feeling like safer not to to skip the SAT. Um, I know it's really, yeah, it's it's rough because SAT and ACT both, right? Um, for decades have been like part of the, of course you're doing this. If you're planning to go to college, of course you're, you know, scheduling in time to study for your SAT, prepare for it, sign up for it, figure out, you know, like balance the schedule with your, um, you know, other commitments, um, it has it has just been this like given. And now all of a sudden it's like it's optional uh, where it used to be like an absolute. <laughs> uh, and that is is like challenging to to work through. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that if you are seeing on the college admissions pages that there's no advantage or disadvantage to doing it, um, you know, hopefully that can be a part of the of like one of the data points that you're using together to decide, you know, make data informed decisions on do it or not. Thanks, Melody. It looks like uh, Lisa asked, uh, could you kind of uh, roughly explain the or generally explain the difference between WAFSA and F uh, FAFSA? Yeah, so FAFSA is what um, most people are going to complete. It's the federal application for free student aid. Um, the, so most people, that's what, that's what you're going to work through and complete. The WASFA is Washington state's version of the FAFSA. Um, you, your student has to, uh, have a social security number in order to be eligible to complete the FAFSA. Uh, so for students in our state, um, who, for whatever reason, don't have a social security number, um, they would fill out the WASPA instead, and that would make them eligible to receive certain types of state aid, as opposed to just like no aid um, if they don't complete the FAFSA because they can't. But most people, if you if your if your student has a social security number, um, you're going to want to have them complete the FAFSA. Thank you. And uh, I, unfortunately, I believe that's all the time we have, but I think we did clear through all the questions. Um, Melody, yeah, thank you so much again for taking the time of your day uh, to share with us all the information you did. And uh, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, I hope everybody got some value out of today's session. Um, but without, uh, I don't wanna keep anyone any longer, but I hope everybody has a wonderful Tuesday. Thank you. Yes, thank you everybody. Thanks, Melody. Take care all. <laughs>